Okay, so after 15 minutes break, I think, I hope you are refreshed. So we would like to move on to the second part. And I would like to introduce Dr. Heidi Kong. She's also a counselor of IEC. And also, as you know, she's a ch chief of NIAMS at NIH. And she's a, world, she's a kind of pioneer of uh, skin microbro, microbro, my, microbiome. And um, I hope she will give us a wonderful overview of the microbiome research. Thank you. Thank Please. you. Thank you very much to um, both Kenji and Emma for the invitation to present a little bit of background on the different techniques that can be used for microbiome research. Um, I have no conflicts to disclose. So I'm going to use the slide as a, an overview of the different topics that I'll be talking about. So this is um, the most common methodology when we talk about microbiome is DNA, direct DNA sequencing. On the left-hand side here, let's see if this works. Ah, there we go. Amplicon sequencing um, on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, shotgun metagenomic sequencing. And then after that, I will talk a little bit about a computational method that we're, we and others have been using more recently to help us analyze shotgun, metagenom shotgun metagenomic data. This is called Metagenome Assisted Genomes, or MAGS. So I'll talk about that. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about how we use culturing to um, integrate with our um, DNA sequencing data either whole genome sequencing, um, sometimes we'll take the entire plate and do shotgun metagenomics from the entire plate. And I won't go into this because they're, um, I'm gonna focus on the sequencing side, but also it's important to be able to have those clinically associated isolates for in vitro and in vivo assays. And then at the end, I'll briefly talk about um, RNA sequencing, um, not from the host side, but from the microbial side. So first, direct DNA sequencing. I mentioned amplicon sequencing. That was the original type of microbiome sequencing where if you target, um, if you want to look at just the bacteria in a sample, you'll do 16S ribosomal RNA gene primers, selecting certain hypervariable regions there. And so then you amplify those using those primers, and then you sequence, and then you can look at what are the bacteria that are in that sample. Um, based on reference databases. If you're interested in fungi, then you'll use a different primer. For example, we use internal transcribe spacer region one or ITS one, and that allows us to help differentiate um, between different malassezia in a sample. So that's well and good, um, but what happens if you wanna look at viruses or you wanna look at all of the microbes together? So that's where you would want shotgun metagenomic sequencing. It allows you to look at relative kingdom abundances, bacteria, fungi, viruses. You get some human DNA in there because you can't really take these samples without some keratinocytes. Um, it allows you to not only identify what is there as in the residents, um, it also, you're, you can also go beyond just species level. You can get strain differentiating markers, virulence genes, antibiotic resistance genes, and get a sense of the functional characterization of the community there. So that is the difference. So for each of these, I'll give you examples of how this has been used. For example, these pie charts represent 16S, where I've been um, our RNA sequencing for ampl amplicon sequencing. And what we showed here, this is an older paper, showing that um, you can have two skin sites that are a few centimeters apart and still have distinct bacterial communities. Um, for example, sebaceous sites tend to have much more um, cutie bacterium previously known as propionobacterium acne. Uh, the darker green are carinibacterium acne, where you'll see more of that in moist creases or folds. Um, and then on broad, flat surfaces of the skin, you'll see much more bacterial diversity. And so because fungi are important in skin diseases, this is using ITS-1 amplicon sequencing. So the purple is malassezia. And even when we get down to the species level, you could see that, again, there's site specificity. Some sites have more malassezia globosa predominance, and others have malassezia restricta predominance. And on the foot sites, you have much more fungal diversity. So then, doing shotgun metagenomic sequencing, you can actually see bacteria, fungi, and viruses together. This was a nice way of validating our amplicon sequencing data. And it also showed us that um, you can have bacteria and fungi are site-specific, but not DNA viruses. DNA viruses tend to 
have a lot more variability across the body surface and from one person to another. So those are examples of amplicon sequencing and shotgun metagenomics. In AD, this is again an older paper, but looking at how you can use 16S um, se sequencing, or amplicon sequencing, to study AD. On the left-hand side, each of those bars represents a healthy child, and on the right-hand side, um, is um, baseline flare and post-flare time points for atopic dermatitis patients. This is just looking at different colors for different staph leucocal species. The main thing is pointing out here is hot pink is staph aureus, dark blue is staph epidermidis, and that there's a relative increase during flares as compared to baseline post-flare and in healthy controls. So that, again, an example of amplicon sequencing for AD. So I mentioned shotgun metagenomic sequencing and a, um, a method to how we analyze it um, better. And the reason why we need something better is that what people don't often talk about is when you have a data set of shotgun metagenomic data, what we typically can do is take those reads and map it to a reference database. So your ability to identify what is in that community is heavily reliant on the database. And reference databases are incomplete. So if you might take a sample, um, and we can have a variation of 10% to even over 50% of that is unmappable. So we call that the dark matter. We don't know what's there. So we have um, worked with, um, in this paper, uh, with Rob Finn's group at EMBL, um, where Rob Finn had developed a methodology to understand what the dark matter is in gut microbiome data. And Sara Saheb Kashef, who is, a, was a, is currently finishing up her MD-PhD um, at Chicago, this is what she did. So it's a very, fairly technical slide, I admit. On the left-hand side, what she did was she took our data from healthy volunteers. And I, you just heard me say that it is site-specific. So we tend to analyze microbiome data based on like one site and comparing that site across people. What she did was taking advantage of the fact that we have multiple sites that we've sampled across a person. Because even if you have two sites that are slightly different, it is not, it's more likely that you might have some bacteria that have spillover that are shared in different sites. So amassing all of that data across that one person, so when she says pool, healthy volunteer, she's taking all of that data from one person and combining that together to make a giant data set. And then she also looked, if you look at pool site in the blue um, orange box, where she's taking all of the foot sites from multiple people and combining that data in order for us to better um, identify what is there. Because what she then does is takes these giant data sets and takes all of these reads, and what happens is you map them based on overlapping regions. And then you get larger pieces of contiguous DNA, so contigs, and based on that, you can bin them, and then you actually potentially develop near-complete genomes. So the beauty of that is that we've actually been able to identify novel microbes by not relying on a reference database, but instead looking at your data that you have in hand. So that's MAGS and how we are using computational methods to look at dark matter. So how about culturing? So we concurrently, in addition to taking samples that we do direct DNA sequencing, we'll take samples and do whole genome sequencing. And I'll show you an example of how we've done that. So a different study where we had um, shotgun metagenomic data and whole genome sequencing of taking um, almost 700 staphylococcal isolates and doing the whole genome sequencing. And what Sara did here was also compare it to available, publicly available data sets worldwide. And I'm just going to show you a little vignette of how whole genome sequencing enabled us to look at these different types of species. So this is from one atopic dermatitis patient. We have Staph epidermidis at the top and Staph aureus on the bottom. And these were from one person. And what we were, she was able to show, because she's doing whole genome sequencing analysis, is that the plasmid or extra chromosomal DNA, this, these, two, these two isolates had over 99.9% I, a similarity in the plasmid, and this encodes for the MUPA gene, or mupirocin resistance. So why this is interesting, it's, it's essentially saying there's sharing of this plasmid, likely, between these two different species. So you may try to eradicate Staph aureus, but 
usually you're not eradicating the staph epidermidis. So what this is showing us is that there are resistance genes that now staph epi is carrying, so that in the future, potentially that can share it with other bacteria as well. So now I'm just gonna wrap up and talk about RNA sequencing again from the microbial standpoint. So we previously have shown using um, DNA sequencing that patients with, some patients with immunodeficiency can have increased viromes or high relative, viral relative abundances and diversity. So what we do because the NIH Clinical Center is um, a mecca for primary immunodeficiency patients or inborn errors of immunity is we've been studying these patients because what it's allowing us to do is potentially identify ways that you can potentially inform clinical care management. Could you use this to identify novel viruses or explore viral evolution? So I'm just going to show you a, a, a small story where we followed patients with hypomorphic RAG1 deficiency, some of them pre and post transplant, where we did RNA-seq of the nares and stool to look for RNA viruses. And in this story, this patient, um, so on this heat map, on the, on the y-axis are different RNA viruses, on the, are, and the x-axis are different patients with, um, with hypomorphic RAG deficiency. And this patient who had no symptoms, no GI symptoms, no history of norovirus, when we actually sequence the stool, we see actually this person has norovirus in the stool. In contrast to this subject who is in, um, circled in green, this person had no GI symptoms and so was tested routinely and was shown to have a, be shedding norovirus. So this suggests that even if the subject or the patient does not have GI symptoms, RAG1 um, deficiency suggests that because there is this association that they should be screened because this would change how we put them in isolation and manage them in the hospital. And this is another example of a subject who didn't really have many symptoms coming in. Um, some of the screens that we do are respiratory pathogen panels. Um, they had a CT chest and it showed um, lung infiltrates on CT. Um, and they were just that, you know, we're not sure what that is. Later on, when we actually sequenced their NARI sample, we found it was a coronavirus 229E, which should have shown up ideally on the pathogen panel, but there was a mutation. So that suggests potentially one might speculate that that may be why it didn't show up on the pathogen panel. So these are some of the ways that we're using um, RNA sequencing to look at microbes on, in and on the body. Um, and so integrating that, and I, we've just heard a lot about host single-cell RNA-seq, so um, integrating that together to look at host microbial interactions. Um, so I basically given a brief overview of DNA sequencing, amplicon sequencing, um, shotgun metagenomics, and how one can use computational methods such as MAGS to help us improve the resolution of samples, and then how culturing helps um, in, when you integrate that with shotgun metagenomic sequencing can help one better understand the microbes present in and on the body, and then how we're using RNA-seq to also look at other microbes. So um, just acknowledging the many people that are involved in this, my longtime collaborator, especially the patients and volunteers who have participated in a shout out to my dermatology colleagues in NIAM's um, intramural program and my email if people have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now the paper is open for discussion. Oops. Any questions from the audience? Either very confusing or very clear. No, no, very clear. Hard to know. Ah, so the question is the methodology. So we tend to do swabs, just because when I take samples, we take up to like 30. So yeah, so uh, tape strips take too long, <laughs> biopsies overwhelming. So we have optimized using swabs. John? Yeah. So, um, how close are we to a unified database for microbiome analysis of skin? Will we ever get there or not? 
A unified database. Um, I think the problem is there's variability in um, processing. I think there's variability in processing and sequencing. And so for us, we compare to within our 15 years of work, we can compare and we have um, consistency across our data sets. I think it's a little bit harder if people are using, for example, amplicon sequencing if they're sequencing different regions of the 16S gene. So I, it's, I think it's harder. I think um, what Saro did do when she analyzed the global data sets, there was a lot of QC involved and there was a lot of kicking out of data that was not um, sufficient quality. Um, and so there is, there is computationally some ways, it's, it's definitely harder. But it would be ideal. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, please. Please, please use the microphone. Uh, thank you for the lecture. I'd like to ask about the microbiome progression hypothesis. In the current understanding of the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis, complex disease, you have immune dysfunction, you have bare dysfunction, and the uh, microbiome. So what's the role of microbiome in the cause of atopic dermatitis? You know, many years ago, you wrote about microbiome progression hypothesis, the staph always that drive the disease. Ah, yeah, that's, we could have a very long conversation about that. Um, so in my view, again, this is personal, um, I think it's more complicated than to say Staph aureus drives it. Um, I think it, we can see examples of where genetics, um, environment, um, they all play an important role. So I think it would be um, overly ambitious to say Staph aureus drives it. That's personal opinion. I think it may contribute to exacerbation, but I, I will not say that it is a major driver. Much more complex. Okay. Any other question? If not, thank you, Heidi. So we would like to move on to the next talk by Dr. Helen He. Uh, she is still a resident of um, Mount Sinai and dermatology resident but she has published a tremendous nice works using uh, proteomics and transcriptome analysis in atopic dermatitis and other skin diseases. And she got a BS from uh, NIH, MIT, and now uh, I'd like to um, introduce you, I'd like you to start presentation, thank you. Thank you so much to the IEC for inviting me to speak today. Um, so my talk is going to be on multi-omics in atopic dermatitis research, as well as the role that tape strips play in multi-omics. Um, I have no disclosures. So although we still have much to learn, we have come a long way in understanding the pathogenesis of AD, which of course involves immune dysregulation of Th2 and other axes, as well as defects, defects in the epidermal barrier, leading to clinical features Paritis, like identification, increased infection risk, and more. And I just used this slide to illustrate both the complexity and the heterogeneity of the AD disease process, where clinical and molecular features vary based on age, ethnicity, IgE levels, um, and more. And we and a big part of um, our current understanding of AD has comes from omics level from omics data. So here in this slide, um, I'm just going to go through a couple of examples of different omics levels as well as some examples of their applications to AD. At the genomic level, GWAS studies have been instrumental in identifying disease-related gene variants, um, and most notably filagrin, but other members of the epidermal differentiation complex as well. Epigenomics um, have uncovered heritable microRNA changes that drive epidermal differentiation, as well as inflammation, and uh, DNA methylation changes have also been identified in AD that may influence downstream gene expression of S100As, keratin 6A, IL-13, and more. Transcriptomics is, I f is where I feel like a bulk of our AD knowledge really comes from, where now the availability of high throughput sequencing methods, microarrays, RNA-seq, at both a bulk level and a single cell level, have facilitated the discovery of new biomarkers uh, related to disease, 
eventually leading to therapeutic targets as well, um, some examples of which are listed on this slide. And there have also been many advances in proteomics, where in addition to older technologies such as ELISA and mass spec, there are now multiplex assays available, Luminex, SomaScan, Olink. And our lab actually does a lot of proteomic profiling of AD. I'm just highlighting this example here because I think it nicely demonstrates how proteomics can be used to study AD disease endotypes. So here, this was a collaboration with Dr. Powler in Northwestern, where serum from AD patients and controls of different age groups, so infants, children, adolescents, and adults, um, were analyzed using serum, uh, using O-link proteomics with a panel of over 370 proteins. And we found that while there was a cluster of proteins that showed increases with age, um, highlighting, and, and many of these proteins were primarily related to atherosclerosis, uh, atherosclerotic signaling and cardiovascular risk, highlighting that systemic inflammation tends to increase with age and AD. There was also a unique um, set of proteins that was uniquely upregulated only in infants with AD, suggesting a um, particular blood proteomic phenotype in that group as well. Metabolomics and lipidomics constitute another omics level. And again, just highlighting an example where omics technology can be applied to understand AD endotypes. Here, um, the authors saw that AD patients with increased IgE had higher expression of various metabolites, free fatty acids, carnitines, tryptophan lactic acid, and more. Um, the microbiome, we just heard a great talk about that, so I'll be very brief here, but the shift towards staph aureus at the expense of diversity and at the expense of beneficial commensals contribute to the barrier destruction, the pro-inflammatory response in likely a very multifactorial way. Um, and then finally, the exposome um, should also be acknowledged where environmental factors, including pollution, diet, both cumulatively throughout one's lifetime, as well as prenatally, also contribute to the immune and barrier abnormalities of AD. So of course, none of these omics layers really occur in a vacuum. Um, instead, they are all synergistic and intricately intertwined, and combining them in a multi-omics approach has several advantages. It potentially allows for a more comprehensive understanding of the disease process, capturing the progress from DNA to RNA to protein, it allows for the potential discovery and validation of new biomarkers and pathways of disease. For example, we previously found that transcriptomic, um, or we previously found very strong correlations between transcriptomic RNA, RNA seq data and proteomic O link data in the lesional AD skin biopsies, which provides some validation for the validity, or it provides some validation for both the transcriptomic and the proteomic signatures, and also suggests that at local level at the skin, the mRNA is likely being translated into protein. And then here, this was a multi-omic overlap analysis um, that took publicly available databases um, taking genomic, epigenomic, transcriptomic, and proteomic data. Um, and the authors here reported many biomarkers and pathways that showed overlap across these different omics levels, um, including, and most notably, filaggrin, which was associated with AD across all four omics layers. Other advantages of a multi-omics approach allows for the integration with clinical data potentially, as well as the elucidation and better characterization of AD disease endotypes. And then it can also uncover some dynamic interactions and signaling pathways, a lot of which can really only be appreciated across different omics levels, such as the interaction between immune cells and the microbiome, for instance. Um, so now I'm going to go through a couple of studies from our lab and others that hopefully illustrate some of these benefits and advantages. So this was a study from our lab that was, like that, uh, that was led by Dr. Benjamin Unger in which multivariable modeling um, was used to show that serum proteomics integrated with skin mRNA biomarkers yielded better multivariable models with better correlations with disease severity as um, measured by SCORA compared to any model from any singular omics level alone. Um, and notably, the 
these correlations were even stronger um, with measures of epidermal hyperplasia, both at baseline and after um, and with therapeutic response with cyclosporin. So overall, integrating proteomics and transcriptomics across tissue compartments can yield very useful multivariable models that integrate multiomic data with clinical outcomes. This was a study by Dr. Weidinger's group in which he showed that uh, the AD lesional epidermis harbors significant DNA methylation differences versus controls, and that also correlated with mRNA expression, so it correlated with transcriptomic data as well for various markers related to epidermal differentiation and innate, and innate immunity, including the S100As, keratin 6 AMB, and OAS1, 2, and 3. Um, and here, this study, I'm highlighting integrated lipidomics with transcriptomics. So the lipidomic data showed an upregulation in AD-affected and unaffected skin versus controls of various metabolites of polyunsaturated fatty acids, as well as metabolites of the COX and LOX pathways, so that's cyclooxygenase and lipoxygenase. And co correspondingly, the transcriptomic data also showed increased mRNA expression of components of the COX and LOX pathways such as ALOX12B and COX1 with validation at the protein level with immunohistochemistry as well. So this study provides some evidence um, for the upregulation of icosanoids and docosanoids um, in the COX and LOX pathways in AD, both in the metabolomic and the transcriptomic level, contributing to the pro-inflammatory microenvironment of AD. Um, we've had a great talk by Dr. Bruner about single cell technology as well, so I'm going to also be brief here. Um, but I want to revisit a study that he had already discussed, but um, I'm revisiting it to emphasize the utility of integrating single cell transcriptomics with other omics modalities. So here, um, again, this was a single cell RNA-seq study that um, that also combined with Oling proteomics on the blister fluid taken from 80 patients and controls. Their proteomic analysis um, showed a total of 42 proteins that were dysregulated, and then they were then they used the single cell transcriptomics to localize the signature, this proteomic signature, to the myeloid cell compartment of macrophages and dendritic cells. So this reinforces the important role of myeloid cells in 80 pathogens. Genesis, and also shows that single cell transcriptomics can be useful for localizing the cellular signature um, of the uh, proteomic signature or of other um, omic signatures. And here I'm highlighting a really interesting study that combined metagenomics, metatranscriptomics, and metabolomic data to characterize the gut microbiome and metabolome of infants with AD as compared to controls. Um, they found that at as early as three weeks of life, there was increased colonization with E. coli and Klebsiella pneumonia, which corresponded to increased gene expression of trehalose metabolism components as well as virulence factors such as LPS and flagellin um, with increased glucan levels in the stool as well. And in contrast, B. fragilis colonization was delayed, which late led to a decrease in um, glycolysis products, as well as butyrate and propionate synthesis products. So um, the authors used a multiomic approach to characterize the disrupted developmental trajectory of um, the gut microbiome in association with genomic, transcriptomic, and metabolomic changes um, in infants with early uh, in infants with early AD. Um, so to facilitate multi-omic studies in the future, it's really important to be able to extract the maximum amount of data possible um, for multiple omics analysis while using the smallest quantity of tissues possible um, from patients. So now I want to introduce or reintroduce um, this concept of tape stripping, which is a minimally invasive skin sampling technique that in which um, tapes are repetitively applied and removed from the same area of skin with standardized pressure, and then the material from those tapes can then be analyzed using various omics platforms 
unlike biopsies, tape strips, they're painless, they don't cause infection or scarring, they're useful in pediatric populations, and as you can imagine, they would be useful in multiomic studies as well, um, where different layers of tapes can be taken from the same patients, and all of these different layers can be analyzed concurrently using different platforms. Um, and we do a lot of tape stripping um, in our lab. A lot of it is in collaboration with Dr. Bissonnette, um, including this study here in which we performed RNA-seq on AD and psoriasis patients, um, and, uh, or from tape strips from AD and psoriasis patients. And we found that tape strips were able to capture the unique transcriptomic features of both diseases, including the preferential TH2 dysregulation and terminal differentiation defects of AD. And we even built a gene classifier showing that INOS was a single gene that could discriminate AD from psoriasis with almost 100% accuracy. 100% accuracy. Um, and then here, we took tape strips from infants with AD and controls, um, and we showed that tape strips um, after, uh, after RNA sequencing was able to capture TH2, TH17, and barrier abnormalities, including terminal differentiation and lipid differences in infants with eczema. Again, just reinforcing that tape strips is useful in adults, but particularly in pediatric population and infants where biopsies are really not possible. Um, so this word cloud is from a study in which we directly compared tape strips to biopsies from the same patients. And here the size of the word reflects the magnitude of the faux change in, a, in the AD versus control comparison. And as you can see, while well, biopsies may have better captured markers of epidermal hyperplasia like the S100As, tape strips actually outperform biopsies for multiple markers, um, multiple immune markers, especially markers of TH2, as you can see from the green color, which are often the biomarkers markers of interest in AD. And then this is just to show that tape strips are useful for capturing not only the transcriptomic signature, but we're talking about multiomics, so they can capture the proteomic signature as well. Where here, this is a study in which we um, took tape strips before and after dupilumab therapy for 16 weeks. And then we found that after dupilumab therapy, um, tape strips capture decreased expression of proteins related to general inflammation, dendritic cells and T cells, TH2, TH17, but not TH1, which is in line with what we saw in biopsies. So this is just to show tape strips are useful for capturing a proteomic signature, and tape strips are also useful for measuring markers of therapeutic response. Um, so now I want to uh, discuss a really interesting study by Donna Leung's group in which multiomics and tape stripping were used to characterize um, AD patients kids with AD with or without food allergy um, as compared to controls. And I'm gonna just summarize um, some of the omics or some of the findings across different omics levels from this study. So at the metabolomic level, um, AD patients, particularly those with food allergies, their tape strips show decreased expression of filigrin breakdown products as well as decreased expression of longer chain ceramides. Their proteomic analysis showed increased keratin 5, 14, and 16 in 80 patients with food allergy tape strips. And then their transcriptomic analysis showed an increased TH2 signature and increased myeloid cell signature um, in the non-lesional tape strips from 80 patients with food allergies. Um, they also took skin swabs for metagenomic shotgun sequencing where they showed an increased staph aureus abundance um, mostly in AD patients with food allergies, with um, correlations to transepidermal water loss only in that group. And then they were able to combine all of these layers in a network analysis in which they showed that keratins, um, filagrin breakdown products, and disease severity show very strong correlations with each other. And then with the supervised analysis, the best predictors of AD with food allergy and transepidermal water loss was the filagrin breakdown products and keratin expression. Um, so overall, just to demonstrate that a uh, that minimally invasive tape strips can be leveraged to do multiple concurrent uh, analyses, and then that can all be integrated together along with clinical data um, to tell a more comprehensive 
a story about the disease process. So here, all of this data kind of point towards, um, so I'm talking the lipid abnormalities, the uh, filagrin breakdown product decreases, keratin increases, the staph aureus abundance, all kind of points towards a disrupted barrier dysfunction with um, hyperproliferative epidermis and um, impaired terminal differentiation in 80 patients with food allergies. Um, so just in summary, while single omics um, studies are important and informative in their own right, they can also be thought of as complementary pieces of a puzzle for a more integrative multi-omics approach that can also be integrated with clinical data. Um, and minimally invasive methodologies such as tape strips are really critical for facilitating these type of multi-omics studies. Um, so I think multi-omics in AD is still relatively new and there's definitely a more a need for more in this uh, a need for more in the future, especially studies that integrate with clinical data. For example, um, more multi-omic um, models for disease severity, um, therapeutic response, and other measures, as well as more detailed characterization using multi-omic approaches of different AD disease endotypes. And with that, um, thank you all for listening. Thank you to my fantastic mentor, Dr. Gutman, the rest of our team at Sinai and all of our collaborators. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, is there any question from the audience? I, I think it's very clear, but uh, so the, at the beginning of this uh, session, uh, Michelle introduced nanostring assay. So did you see, look at the nanostring and molecular profile of many skin diseases doing biopsy samples. But you are, what you do is mainly tape stripping and also uh, blister, and so more, less invasive. But um, uh, what is a strong point of, uh, can, what is the difference between nanostring assay and your RNA sequence assay? What is the strong and weakness of your study? Sorry, just to clarify the difference between mm. the. Uh, can, can you repeat the last part one yeah. more time? I'm sorry. Nanostring using biopsy samples. So maybe the price or cost wise or technical, the easy, easiness or. Biopsy versus yeah. like less invasive, such as tape yeah. strips yeah. or um, yeah. blister fluid, you're saying? Yeah. Maybe. maybe. I'll just take a, the question about the nanostring. So we, we've looked into nanostring a while ago. Um, that's good for a paraffin embedded tissue. You are losing information. It's not the same as doing RNA-seq in a, a frozen tissues, a, but it has the plus that you can, of course, profile a, all the patients. Um, so in this study that actually we published, as Helen will tell you, we actually compared head-to-head -head biopsies and tape strips. Uh, but in many of our profiling, we are still doing biopsies. You know, they are still uh, viable. Uh, I do think that when possible, it's better to do RNA-seq. You get many more genes, uh, and you are not restricted. And you saw we, with one single gene, we were able to differentiate 100% between AD and psoriasis. And we now are doing it in other diseases. So the goal, I think, is to find one single classifier to differentiate diseases. You know, each one has pluses and minuses. Non-string is great if you want to do, a, a, I mean, biopsies that are in paraffin, which we can do as well. It just, I think, it's better, if possible, to do, a, you know, rna seq in frozen. But it's a matter of possibilities. There's definitely advantages of both techniques. Um, there, again, there are cases where, for larger scale studies, I guess biopsies are just very difficult to get like that adequate sample size and power um, in order to actually detect, you know, significant biomarkers of interest. Um, but of course, you can see the dermis; it's more useful for the dermal cytokines. We've discussed collagens, um, which have come up in some of our analyses. So, so I guess there's applications and uses for both techniques, I would say, depending on what your research question of interest is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please.
Um, so I'm hoping I, I heard it well enough, but you're saying the trauma from the tape stripping itself. Um, yeah, well, first of all, I'll say that we, oh, sorry, for a lot of our studies, we'll take like 20 tape strips and we will remove the first tape strip. So some of that most superficial level is removed. Um, we have, like there probably is some component of that as well, but we do, we have also like done a direct comparison as well as correlations with our biopsy data. And generally this upregulation of cytokines, they correlated very well with the biopsies where the trauma may not be as relevant and the tape strips. So I would say based on our experimental and anecdotal experiences, I don't think the trauma plays a large role in seeping into the signature that we see. Yeah, I, I would just add that's an excellent question. And when we started to do tape strips, that was, of course, a, a question that we thought about. And we were surprised how well actually the phenotype, you know, the proof is always in the pudding. Uh, so the phenotype of a uh, tape strip skin correlates uh, like 0.8 and more with the biopsies. So if the trauma had such an effect, that would not be the case. And also when we see patients, basically 20 minutes later, they forgot that they even had something on the skin. So the trauma is not that much. You only take 15 to 20 tapes. If you go deeper, Donald Leung actually had a great study showing that if you do more than 30 tapes, then you'll probably have that trauma. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So if I have no other questions, thank you, Helen, for your excellent talk. So I would like to move on to the last speaker, Dr. Uh, Andrew G. Uh, he got BS at MIT, medical degree at Cornell, and then uh, postdoc at Paul Cavari this lab and did her, his residency training at Stanford, and now at, as, as assistant professor at uh, Mount Sinai, New York. And he will give a lecture about uh, in, uh, yeah, single cell resolution spatial transcriptomes analysis. Please start. Uh, thank you, Professor Kawashima, for the kind introduction. Um, thank you to both Professor Kawashima and Professor Gutman and the IEC for the invitation to speak with you today. Um, I'm going to be sharing uh, some of our group's early efforts to apply single cell resolution spatial transcriptomics on human skin. Um, I want to emphasize that uh, this is uh, mostly what I'll show you is unpublished work and very much uh, a work in progress, but I'm excited to share it with you all today. I also have to mention that this is, without a doubt, the most extravagant lecture hall that I've ever had a chance to speak in. <laughs> so even though this talk will be relatively technical in nature, I want to start by introducing the central question that our lab is interested in and what motivates our desire to achieve single cell resolution spatial profiling. And that is to understand how the diverse cell types within a complex tissue such as skin communicate one, with one another to uh, drive the biology within the tissue. And we believe that understanding this communication and blocking or restoring effective communication is a viable therapeutic strategy as illustrated um, over and over uh, in our field, uh, such as the use of uh, biologic therapies like monoclonal antibodies that block cytokine signaling. And so I'd just like to show this histology of normal skin contrasted with uh, squamous cell carcinoma tissue just to illustrate how uh, drastic the differences in cellular composition and spatial arrangement of these cell types can be across these tissues. So in order to start addressing these questions, we, we need the proper tools. And I want to briefly overview uh, the, a brief evolution of gene expression profiling tools that have really accelerated our ability to ask and address some of these questions. So I'll borrow this Lego analogy provided by a Harvard professor, Bo Shaw, where um, this uh, human brain organ can be represented by this group of Legos color-coded by um, uh, different cell types represented by different colored Legos. And so, Early on, we were able to use bulk RNA sequencing, which allowed us to take a chunk of this tissue and isolate RNA from it and sequence the transcripts. But um, it was very difficult to tell exactly where those transcripts were located in the tissue, as well as which cell types were expressing them. 
Then along came single cell RNA-seq, which of course uh, answered the question of uh, which cell types are expressing the, the transcripts of interest. And I won't harp on how much single cell RNA sequencing has helped advance our understanding of, of skin disease. But one crucial limitation of the technology is that in that dissociation process, you lose the uh, spatial context within which the cells reside. So more recently, spatial transcriptomics has allowed us to preserve the in situ spatial context of the transcripts. Um, and while that's been a super important advancement in, in our understanding of the spatial organization within tissues, there are some important limitations that need to be understood in order to maximize biological insights from these data sets, uh, as well as improve upon the technologies. So I'll briefly overview uh, spatial transcriptomics as a technology. And there are several modalities uh, that encompass this technology, which roughly break down into three categories. Uh, in situ hybridization, or ISH, in situ sequencing, or ISS, and in situ capture, or ISC. And I'll start with the last category, ISC, because uh, most of you are likely familiar with this particular technique, which has been commercialized uh, by 10X Genomics and their Visium platform. And so this uh, technique involves taking your tissue slice and, uh, uh, and adhering it to a special slide that contains these barcoded capture spots. So when the tissue is permeabilized and the transcripts fall down onto the slide, they are captured by these spots. Each of them is uniquely barcoded and read out via sequencing both the transcript and the barcode so that you can effectively map the transcripts back to their positional locations in the tissue. Um, there are some limitations to this technique, which I'll go over, namely, um, mainly in the form of resolution, which I'll talk about in the next slide. But very briefly, these other two technologies are also now commercialized. Um, for ISH, uh, in the form of VisGen Merscope, as well as Nanostring's Cosmex platform, and in situ sequencing in the form of 10x Xenium. And so um, I largely view the differences between these two technologies as academic. Um, practically speaking, they both involve fluorescent imaging readout as the, as the readout to identify your transcripts, uh, as in contrast with in situ capture, which involves uh, next generation sequencing. So what do I mean by resolution? Well, the, the exact definition is basically how definitive of a location you can map that transcript or that recovered transcript back to. Um, and so here, uh, this is actually data from uh, my postdoc work, uh, but I want to focus your attention on, oops, on the um, uh, diagram here, which shows the capture size spots and the, and the spatial arrangement of, of the spots in the 10X Visium platform. And so as you can see, they are 55 microns in diameter and 100 microns spaced apart, center to center distance. That's of course very hard to appreciate without uh, truly drawn to scale images. And so in order to get a better idea or illustrate the, the true scale, I'm gonna introduce some more data that was included in, in that paper, which was uh, MIBI spatial transcriptomics, or sorry, spatial proteomics, multiplex ion beam imaging, which involves a readout of about 40 proteins using antibody panels. But this data is single cell resolution in that you can actually pinpoint which cell is expressing your particular protein of interest. And it's accelerated by uh, machine learning algorithms such as segmentation that actually break down the image into those single cells to allow you to map back the proteins expressed to their exact cell. Um, here is the Visium spot array overlaid across uh, this particular image. And hopefully you get uh, two things from this. I apologize for the blurriness of the slide, but you can appreciate that the spot size actually captures uh, more than one cell. In fact, about a dozen or so cells, as indicated by the, the histone H3 signal, which is the turquoise. You can see multiple uh, nuclei in this particular spot. And the other thing that may be underappreciated is the spacing of these spots leaves all these gaps in the tissue. And those are essentially unprofiled areas of the tissue and represent really missing pieces of information from your data set. So um, I'm gonna introduce one technique that we've been using that does partially overcome some of these limitations, and that is uh, MRFISH, or multiplexed error robust fluorescence in situ hybridization, one of the in situ hybridization techniques. So this is a technique that uses targeted um, oligo probes that target up to 500 genes at once in your tissue of interest. And the way this particular technology works is that each of these probes 
targets a unique gene but contains overhangs that also bind to fluorescent probes. And basically through subsequent serial rounds of imaging flowing through these fluorescent probes one by one, round by round, uh, it generates either a fluorescent signal or not, which then over the course of multiple rounds of imaging provides a binarized barcode that essentially allows you to identify all the transcripts that are in your panel. <clears throat> And it gives you data that looks something like this, where you can see each of these little spots within um, each of the cell outlines here represents a single transcript, and they're colored by their uh, particular gene species or gene name. And so um, maybe it's easier to illustrate by looking at uh, some data, but this is actually data from Tenex's, uh, sorry, from uh, VizGen's website which shows basically progressively zoomed in sections of starting with a whole slice of mouse brain tissue, where you can start to zoom in to a couple dozen or so cells and start to see that you can really effectively achieve subcellular, subcellular resolution of these transcript spots. You can tell essentially where these transcripts are within an individual cell. And so we've uh, been working hard to optimize this to apply to human skin, we spent a long time optimizing. Um, but this is some of that data here. So what I'm showing here is a UMAP plot of MRFish data. And so those of you who are familiar with single cell RNA sequencing are likely familiar with UMAPs, but each point on this uh, two-dimensional plot represents a single cell. And cells with similar transcriptomes, in this case a 500 gene profile, tend to cluster with one another, and that allows you to annotate cell types by clusters. And what you see here are the different clusters colored by the different cell types. So it does resemble single cell RNA sequencing in many ways. Uh, but there's one key distinction here, and that's that we know the spatial positioning of these cells. And so this effectively gives us single cell resolution spatial transcriptomics data. So we've been able to generate MRFish data from several sections of human tissue, human skin tissue. And on the left here, I'm showing you a UMAP of about 180,000 cells that we've recovered across five tissue sections. They are annotated by their cell type here on the left in the UMAP space. And then their spatial positioning is shown in the five tissue sections on the right. For example, this dark red cluster of epidermis cells that we're able to annotate localized to the superficial layer of the tissue as expected for human skin. And these bar plots on top just show consistent recovery of each of these cell types across our tissue sections. And we tend to think of the variation here and the proportions of the cell types as true biological variation um, that is not subject to biases that can be introduced, for example, by different dissociation protocols in single cell RNA sequencing. One um, early observation we've made is that there are drastic, there can be drastic sensitivity differences at the gene level between Visium data and MRFish data. So this particular example I'm showing you is of the expression of PDGFRA uh, on the left in Visium data and on the right in the MRFish data. Okay, yeah, that's better. Yeah. Sorry. Um, and PDGFRA is a known fibroblast marker. Its expected expression is, is expected to be quite high in the dermis where we know fibroblasts reside. But you can see in the Visium data, most of these spots actually register zero counts of PDGFRA. So this is really uh, a limitation in the sensitivity of this particular technique to recover PDGFRA transcripts. But on the right, you can see across these four tissue sections, we're seeing much better capture of PDGFRA across the entire dermis where we know that fibroblasts are located throughout the tissue. Um, there are special or, or unique types of analyses you can do with this single cell resolution data. For example, you can ask what cell types like to be next to one another, which is what this heat map shows. It's basically a, a pairwise uh, heat map that just shows you the frequency of how often these cells like to be next to one another. And so here just cell types are listed in both the columns and rows. And the heat map shows, uh, the red color shows increased frequency of, of neighboring cell types, uh, while the blue shows depleted or, or less frequent uh, neighboring relationships. Another way you can show this is through a network plot. This is the exact same data on the left, just shown differently as a network plot on the right. But just to highlight some of this uh, interesting early observations, we see that this right network contains mostly epithelial cells, for example, keratinocytes that make up the epidermis. Next, are next to each other as expected. 
Even the non-epithelial cells like melanocytes and Langerhans cells that we know are scattered throughout the epidermis show up, as well as sebaceous gland cells that we know are next to each other in the gland. Um, but interestingly, uh, there are, there's this very intricate network of immune and stromal cells that make up the dermis, and we want to explore that further. Um, another observation we've made is that we can effectively localize different fibroblast subpopulations that are recovered from these data. Um, this is something that people have seen in single cell RNA sequencing data sets, that there's heterogeneity of fibroblasts, but the location of those subpopulations has been hard to pin down. Here we definitely clearly see that there is a group of fibroblasts that like to be superficial or in the papillary dermis, another group that likes to be deeper in the reticular dermis, and interestingly also another group that uh, seems to be close to the, the vascular or the blood vessels within the dermis. And then another thing that we're trying to do is break down the uh, cell types within skin and organizing them into communities or neighborhoods of cells that um, form many niches. And one way um, we do this is by essentially building neighborhoods of cells, of groups of cells that like to be next to one another. And so in this heat map, or sorry, in, it, in this U map, what I'm showing you aren't single cells, but actually neighborhoods of cells containing multiple cell types that recurrently occur and frequent in, in similar proportions across the neighborhoods. And we can essentially try to break down the tissue into these neighborhoods of cells that make up these uh, uh, cellular communities. And so those 15 neighborhoods that I showed you are groups of cells, as I mentioned, and here are different proportions of how often other cell types like to be in, in each other's neighborhoods. And what that allows us to do is restrict our cell-cell communication analyses into these neighborhoods, um, basically spatially restricting our cell-cell communication analysis. And so this heat map just shows on the, in the columns uh, each of the neighborhoods. The rows are ligand receptor pairs that are co-expressed within the neighborhoods and just showing some, some highly expressed ligand receptor pairs that are present within each neighborhood. And so we're highly interested in understanding how these neighborhoods might change or might uh, actually lead to new neighborhood formation across different contexts such as diseases. So with that, I'll conclude and, and thank members of my lab, especially those who have really driven the MRFISH efforts. Um, I want to thank uh, collaborators near and far, as well as funding sources, and uh, thank you all for your attention. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Andrew, for a very nice, nice talk. So, this paper is now open for discussion. Yeah, Hi, it was a, a very nice talk. So, um, I work in an institute where we do a lot of macrophage research with Martin Gilliams, who's like looking in the liver, spatial transcriptomics. And they advise us always before we do this, before we do a MRFISH or, or a Maxima analysis, which is more protein based to do a single cell analysis first, so to get your top genes, otherwise it's really a fishing expedition, so I think that's something, I mean, it's really important to, to point out. And then, the second thing, I was really triggered about your neighborhood analysis, so um, some of the people in our institute, like Ivan Seiss wrote NicheNet, they're now also developing spatial NicheNet, so is that something you're moving into, so within a neighborhood, getting a more directed uh, bioinformatics approach to predict who's talking with who and how they're talking. Communication uh, between cells, right? Yeah, um, so just to address your first point about um, the need to do single cell RNA sequencing on your tissue before um, doing some of these targeted approaches, I actually agree with that. Um, the 500 genes is, can be used up quite quickly, and so you have to really take advantage of every single one of those genes and obviously the more you know about your tissue in terms of the genes that discriminate cell types or specific biological pathways you might be interested in uh, can be very important and actually uh, is something that we spend a lot of time on in designing our panels. And so one of the disadvantages on the non-sequencing based techniques is that the burden is on you as an investigator to really determine what, what is most interesting and what to include in your panel. Um, the second part about bioinformatics tools to infer cellular communication Yes, I've used NicheNet before, um, and there are really amazing tools that allow you to infer cell-cell uh, communication from, from single-cell RNA sequencing data. I think um, I would still rely on those to, to do some of these 
Like MeshNet, for example, works by using a target gene expression, a ligand driving a target gene expression, and you really need good uh, coverage of your, of your transcriptome to kind of make those predictions. Some of these techniques are unlikely to yield uh, as deep of information from your data set to say, you know, there's these certain gene targets that are upregulated that are indicative of a certain ligand signaling to that. Um, I would view these more as identifying cells as well as maybe particular molecules that would indicate like ligand receptor pairs that are co-expressed um, and spatially restricting those analyses instead of with single cell RNA sequencing analysis, you can kind of get thousands of hits, right? Because right. a lot of things are co-expressed on but different cell types. If, if you're gonna do your pick of 500 genes, I think it's important to incorporate NishNet to make an educated guess about the 500 genes because otherwise, you know, if you're really gonna study neighborhood communication, you might have to do it two, three times before you actually end up with the right 500 to, or you have to do it neighborhood by ne per neighborhood, and yep. then go for 500 in the neighborhood, right? Yep, so you're not gonna get a full picture, um, but what we've done is we've basically taken 250 of the genes and dedicated them to cell type discrimination, which we think does a pretty good job at, you could kind of see the UMAP really breaking, breaking those clusters, separating those clusters of cell types out. And then we kind of reserve the other half for ligand receptor pairs that we know are highly expressed by the cells. Great, great, yeah. thanks. Okay. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. Thank you so much. And the other meeting will start soon, so <laughs> please make your way slowly. <laughs> yeah, so we'd like to close this session. And I, lastly, I'd like to thank all the excellent speakers from all over the world, seven speakers, and also the audience. Thank you very much.